uh, yes, uh, share my screen and we will do this application window. Thank you very much. Yes, share. Great. How to raise financing. Okay, this is uh, going to be a talk on how to raise financing for a startup. I will uh, talk about my experiences and my visibility of companies both in the UK and in the US. Uh, this is part of a series of talks uh, for entrepreneurs in coincidence with the Wolfson College Cambridge University Entrepreneurship Competition. Uh, we've had one talk already on how to create a pitch. Uh, this will be the second of a series of four talks, uh, which will be on financing, and we will have two more, and we'll culminate in the um, uh, April time frame with the actual judging competition uh, where companies can apply uh, to the uh, Wilson College Cambridge University uh, entrepreneurship competition with a, uh, a series of uh, stellar judges, investors, inventors and scientists at that event. It will, will all be online. Uh, who am I? I'm uh, a Wilson College graduate from about 30 uh, years ago, 32 years ago. Um, but I run the R42 Institute, which is a venture capital firm, uh, but also an institute which gives uh, uh, education in artificial intelligence. Uh, the venture capital firm invests in deep science, tough tech, uh, artificial intelligence and biotech in particular. Uh, we do actually also have opportunities if you're, uh, um, well, actually you don't have to be a student, you can also be a professional for to work on um, a, an AI project or mentor an AI project. Uh, we also have a founders program uh, where we have a few set of, a uh, small set of companies where we will uh, mentor and follow and uh, help uh, get off the ground. Uh, R42 itself and I myself am based in Palo Alto, California. Uh, my background after Wolfson College was I, I couldn't get a job, so I had to start companies. And um, mainly in the mobile space, uh, but then went to MIT and then went to Stanford University. At Stanford University, I'm part of a project known as the Boundaries of Humanity uh, project, which is looking at intelligence in humans, animals, and machines in the age of biotechnology and artificial intelligence. Uh, I'm a solid, uh, you know, true blue entrepreneur, got my uh, uh, chops in over many decades. Uh, starting from uh, companies with just like two people to uh, large corporations. And um, today we'll talk about where do you get financing. So if you're like me, when you started with uh, just a, a couple of people, uh, where would you actually get the financing and what are the particular avenues? Uh, so the first kind of financings are finances that do not take a percentage of your company. Uh, you can think of it as almost as free cash. Uh, so uh, both in the US and the UK, there are um, uh, opportunities to apply for grants. In the UK, uh, there's the Innovate UK program. Uh, in the US, there is the SBIR program uh, with the number of government bodies. Uh, usually these checks start at around about 25k or so. Uh, there are also academic uh, initiatives um, in the uh, there's the I Corps program in the uh, um, in the US and a similar program in the UK where they'll give you like 25 50k uh, just to travel and meet and meet customers and extract customer needs. Uh, these uh, initial grants in the tens of K range uh, often have follow on uh, grants, which uh, can be up to about $2 million or so. And uh, uh, so that could be over like, um, you know, a year or two range. Uh, the next kind of thing, which I've always been quite fond of is prizes. Um, there are a number of business competitions out there. Many of them are very small. No, $1,000, $2,000, $10,000. Uh, 
Uh, often those are useful for interconnecting with investors and corporates. Uh, uh, often they have demonstration days, so we will have that at Wolfson College. Uh, but some of the prizes are actually quite large. Uh, one of my companies was Bounce Imaging, um, which built a throwable camera. It's a ball which had cameras inside it. And uh, as you threw it, it would take a live 360-degree uh, stitched video image. And we were running out of money, but fortunately we won the Verizon prize. And how much was the Verizon prize? That was a million dollars. Uh, so I like to say that's like like more expensive than a Nobel Prize even. Uh, so quite, quite there are prizes that can be quite significant. And that was free cash uh, without any investment, without any percentage of the company. Uh, the next type of prize is there's also prizes relating to um, investment prizes. So the same company, Bounce Imaging, uh, it won actually several prizes. They got onto the prize kick. Uh, they won the um, 42 North Prize, which has nothing to do with R42, uh, but it's based in uh, Buffalo, New York, um, at the 40 degree, 42 degrees latitude, uh, where they uh, received an investment into the company, uh, a $500,000 investment into the company uh, that matched uh, venture capital uh, investment. The next set, uh, commonly known in the entrepreneurial community, is uh, the three Fs, uh, friends, family, and fools. Not to say that friends and family are lumped into the fools category, but rather these are people who uh, are really basically giving faith money. They, they really trust in you as an entrepreneur. Uh, often the numbers are relatively uh, small. They're usually in the 10K range, 20K range. Um, maybe up to about 100k, uh, and um, really, you know, we're, this is the point when the entity is at a very, very early stage, and we want to really get, uh, you know, do our best. And you know, really, the only people who will give us money are people who kind of like know us, uh, know us from our previous track record, know us as people, and uh, you know, you have to think about not taking too much. Uh, from these people because uh, you have to sort of think about can they actually withstand the loss uh, because uh, this is really the riskiest stage of the entity. So there's a two-way street. Just because somebody wants to give you funding, you might actually want to think for yourself, can whoever's giving it to you, can they actually withstand the loss? Uh, the next stage are, is angel investors. Um, and these, what are angel investors? Angel investors are high net worth individuals. These are not corporations. Uh, usually these are people who have built their assets in some form of business. Um, some are more mundane businesses, some are more uh, uh, tech type businesses. Uh, here you're really looking, uh, not, again, not just for the money, but really their experience. Now, is there a match to their experience and how they can actually help the entity in addition to the actual uh, cash point of view. Uh, as we move on from angel investors, we then move on to quasi-institutions. So it starts off with accelerators and incubators, uh, usually an accelerator or incubator that we're looking at like a 50K, 100K, maybe 150K kind of arrangement. Many of these entities are now uh, global in this online um, world. And so it used to be you had to sort of show up and show up to demo meetings and uh, coaching meetings in person. Now, since everything's online, a lot of these entities are now broadened out to more of a global basis. Um, and again, these are sort of in this 50K, 100K range. Finally, we gravitate to institutional financing, uh, so-called venture capital firms. And there's a very, very wide range of financing levels from these firms. Some are really overlapping with angel investors in the 100, 200, 500K range. Uh, and uh, some at the highest levels uh, can be at the 100 million range. SoftBank is notorious for that, that level where the, basically if you've got a company that needs to scale, uh, but you've got the recipe sorted out, you just need to multiply it across, say, 100 cities or 1,000 cities around the world, 
Uh, it's where you just uh, that that where you need large scale financing, and it is actually possible. There's actually been uh, been done. So, how do we find these investors? Uh, I think I mentioned before. Uh, you know, is trying to find investors who can give you more than just money. What you're looking for is, do they actually have customers in their network that will be useful to the company? Customers are number one because they do not take a percentage of the company. Uh, the second is partners. So these could be corporate partners who they have customers that can bring to the small entity. Um, and the third is, the, actually, do they have co-investors do they have friends who like the network? And this goes back to like matching. There's hundreds, thousands of investors, but what we really need to do is match to the right investor to the right segment that you're in. And many companies that I've met with or coached, they will talk to uh, 50 or 60 investors, um, but only two will invest. Uh, does that mean those two people are very, very clever? Or does that mean they're very stupid because the other 58 have turned turned you down? And usually it's neither. It's usually a matching component. It's people who are familiar with your space, can understand the space, and really got to figure out who in the area would be able to understand your story. And so a few tricks for doing that is one is certainly some venture firms, some investors are well known to be investors in a particular market segment so maybe some people invest in ai companies i like ai companies some invest in biotech companies others uh look for uh, um uh, companies in a different area and it might be a real estate one uh, another uh, one trick is look at companies in your segment that are you know, not competitive with you but adjacent to you and see who invested in them and then you can sort of sort of have a then at least you can have a uh, a sensible conversation uh, with um, with those uh, investors. Finally, uh, temperament. Uh, there might be very very clever people, and uh, that you might be able to uh, obtain investment and attract funds from. But can you actually engage with them? Can you actually have a candid conversation? Do you get on with the investors? Or are they really going to be a pain in the neck every time you talk? Can you actually have a very candid, genuine conversation to brainstorm uh, ideas, potentials, tracks, strategies uh, without feeling uncomfortable and walking on eggshells? In fact, that's probably the most important uh, because if you were actually have an, e can have an easy conversation, you can actually have a... Um, uh, a stronger outcome let's talk about term sheets uh, and i'll talk about uk and us since uh, many companies are now uh, receiving investment from across the world uh, and particularly in this uh, online world uh, both in the uk and the us there are uh, tax incentives uh, in the uk there are these schemes known as seis eis what this basically does uh, for investments in small companies, uh, the investor receives a tax credit. Uh, note that's a tax credit, not a tax deduction uh, for investments in small companies. This is available only to UK taxpayers. And uh, this uh, means basically they get uh, 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 actual hard cash discount in their yearly tax payments if they make some investments into small companies in that year in the us we don't have that but we do have uh, what's called the uh, qualified small business um, investment act which basically says if you hold an investment in a small company for more than five years then the capital gains tax is uh, uh, is free uh, after that point that's at the federal level now, what we do have differences in uh, the UK and the US. In the UK, typically, uh, all stock that's purchased is common stock. So all the shares have equal rights. Um, in the US, uh, nearly every investment is made at either a preferred stock, which means upon liquidation, the preferred stock gets a higher um, preference uh, over the common stock, or 
are a convertible debt. No, it's spelt wrong. A convertible debt. Uh, and these convertible debts usually have a valuation cap. So you have to decide, you know, how much is the company worth? We'll talk about that in a second. And um, uh, and we talk about valuations uh, where uh, the, the, uh, uh, the amount of money coming in will take a percentage of the company. So if we are worth um, $2 million and we raise $500,000, uh, then that is uh, 20% of the company we're giving up if it's on a pre-money level. Um, and if it's uh, at a post-money level, then it is at a 25% because 500,000 divided by two. And typically we have the option pool included in the valuation. So what does that liquidation preference mean? And often even in the UK when it's common stock, usually there are some clauses that say the People who actually put real money in actually get their money back. But uh, we have this concept of liquidation preference. So the money that comes in, uh, what the investor says is usually if they have a liquidation preference of one, is that they either get their money back or their pro rata shareholding. So if they have 25% uh, of the company, uh, they'll get their money back or um, you know, so say they put the 500,000, they'll get their 500,000 back. That will happen if you sell for less than 2.5, an example I've given. Uh, or if you're now worth 20, they'd rather just take their shareholding because it's 25% of 20% uh, uh, of, um, uh, of 20, which is 4 million, which is much higher than the 500,000. Uh, if the liquidation preference is two, then they want two times their money back or their shareholding. Uh, and uh, you have this other, the third concept known as participate preferred, um, not that common these days, where you get your 1x or your 2x back first, then you get your shareholding pro rata for the rest. There's a number of ways to structure uh, these um, uh, uh, preferences. Uh, vesting. As founders, uh, typically uh, founders usually vest their component. So if you've given up 25% of your company and you've got 70, that means you own 75%, you think, well, you know, I'm now a millionaire. Uh, usually uh, the, you don't, don't start with the entire 75%. You build up the 75% over the next five years. Now, when founders, you know, often start their companies, we're not paying as much attention. And they say, well, we still own the 20, 75%, the whole lot. Uh, it's usually not recommended uh, to do that. Usually you should start vesting relatively early because uh, when professional investors come in, they will force uh, the founders to start vesting from day one. Uh, so it's in one's interest to start the clock early uh, because when the uh, the venture firms come in, they'll start make you do it anyway. And if you're lucky, you won't need to restart the clock if you're all, the clock's already going. Uh, the other reason to do it is that if you're a part of a team and one of you leaves, then one of the biggest risks is team risk. Uh, then you have a, 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 a um, framework for how much uh, is given to the lever versus the people who stay on. And clearly people who stay on the entire five years or longer, you know, they'll get more versus somebody who stays on six months. Usually often there's a, a one-year cliff that you stay for one year before you get uh, your proportional representation on vesting uh typically the, in these term sheets in these financing agreements there's loads of clauses that sound nasty either for the founders or the investors uh, a lot of these clauses if they're very aggressive don't hold up in subsequent uh financing so like one of the common ones is anti-dilution clauses um you know, which basically says that you keep your percentage no matter what so if you someone invests and, uh, and buys 25 percent of the company it says I always own 25%. Um, but a new investor will come in and uh, it'll be a higher valuation, so the absolute value will be higher, uh, but they will want the, the uh, dilution to happen for all parties. Uh, similarly, if the deal's too good uh, for the investor, uh, people uh, in subsequently do need say, well, the founders need an incentive to actually uh, continue with the company. They're not slaves. So anything that you know, it becomes too skewed where the founders don't have enough incentive, uh, often that will be readdressed uh, later on. And basically the new money calls the shots. 
uh you know you could say the inside investor come in and price it but usually that doesn't have integrity professional investors usually want a new investor to come in and price the deal um so what's the valuation how, how much is the company worth um in, in, it is very much an art um often it's through comparatives you know what other companies are being invested at and it's different valuations of different uh, countries and different types of companies uh it's important to be reasonable otherwise you get skewed you know and, and you get a, a terms that do not hold up later on um now this is out of seed legals a chart from there in valuations in the uk uh, depending where you're at whether you're an idea stage or prototype stage and here we're seeing companies you know in the sort of the uh, 500,000 pound range to the 2 million pound range if you have revenue um in silicon valley the valuation is somewhat higher um and often british companies are saying well you know they've got this silicon valley company that's valued at this uh why can't i be that but basically you have to be here to get these there's more competition there's more uh money here there's more companies here uh to actually uh to invest in uh there are ratios out there uh, multiples of revenue multiples of ebitda uh sometimes you get credit for patents uh depending on the kind of companies you'll have different metrics uh biotech companies often early stage do not have an, have no revenue uh sometimes marketplace companies are based on user metrics um often you have an option pool of course of 10 to 20 percent and uh depending on the type of company you are uh, you might be valued higher uh, on a metrics basis uh, versus other kinds of companies. So typically software companies have higher margins than hardware companies, so you get a higher multiple for that. Uh, similarly, cloud software gets a higher multiple to on-premises software. And thirdly, you know, if you have recurring revenue that people are just paying you checks every month uh, uh, and you don't have to keep selling to them, that will be a higher valuation than uh one where you have to keep selling you have to keep knocking on the doors and sell uh, a unit one at a time and then overlaid on this are other metrics depending on the industry you're in uh like churn ratios when people uh churn off and stop buying your product people want to know these numbers and can have an effect on the valuation of the company and going forward you've got to look at where uh no where you're going to be when you're starting out you now wh what kind of company am i going to be uh to be actually uh, get a call so for example a cloud company um is certainly uh you might get a bigger multiple but you also have to spend more uh in uh in, in infrastructure and maintenance uh, accordingly there are lots of other metrics you know sometimes there's people metrics um you know there's this uh, uh metric of like you know the number of engineers you have uh it used to be like a million dollars an engineer uh, and if you were doing deep science, deep tech, you know, it could be up to like $10 million a PhD. Uh, and so you found a lot of companies would uh, sort of just hire people uh, just to add up to their, um, uh, to increase their valuation. But the thing is, if it's not needed, then you won't get that extra credit. Uh, we talked about the revenue multiples, uh, often the EBITDA numbers, you know, the multiples for EBITDA. How do, why is it six? Why is it 30? Um, in the stock market, you've got this thing, price earnings divided by growth. They call it the peg ratio. Um, and that's usually between one to four. So the idea of your earnings are uh, growing at 30%, then you get price earnings ratio 30. And then you can use that to factor into your, uh, um, your, your multiple. Uh, and then you've got cash in the bank. Cash is just worth cash. It usually doesn't give you a multiple on top of what cash you've got. And the key question is, the key uh, thing to do as a founder is never run out of cash. Uh, we typically need to have 12 months of runway. Uh, as we're doing a financing, um, it'll take uh, often take six months to raise a financing. Uh, typically, you're giving up 20% of the, of the round. Um, uh, there are some like mega deals, as I talked about, you know, with like $100 million rounds. Uh, but uh, you have to constantly, the CEO's job is thinking about raising funds and deciding how much to raise now. Uh, you know, you could raise a lot right now and that would extend your runway or you can, you can actually try and raise as little as possible, but then you have a, 
an issue of financing risk later on. If you get to the end of your runway and you run out of cash, uh, then it is very, very difficult. So how do you create a hot deal? Um, often this is you. Uh, who are you? Uh, what's your background? What's your education? Have you ever done a company before? Uh, uh, the the uh, competitiveness, are you in a hot space? Um, people who want to get into your deal that makes you a hot company. If you're a hot company, maybe you only have to give up 15% instead of 20 or 25%. Uh, typically, if you can get a higher valuation, you use the opportunity to raise a bit more money. So it still ends up being uh, 20%. And Figuring out if you're hot is, first of all, saying, well, are you in a hot space? This is the Gartner hype cycle uh, where different technologies start off early and people are not sure what they are. And then over time, people think, they, you know, this is the best thing since sliced toast. Um, and uh, then after a while, people say, well, actually, you can't make toast, really. It's not as uh, strong as it is. And people get disillusioned. Uh, uh, you've got, but if you're at the peak of inflated expectations, you can call the shots better than if you're in this disillusionment period. So as you're building up, you know, as you're building the innovation, timing is a key factor of whether you can A, raise financing at all, and B, what valuation you can raise it at. Uh, you can generate um, oversubscription. PR is important. Uh, one idea is to raise chunks, small amounts of chunks at small ratchet valuations so you may be able to raise a small amount of money and uh, a certain reasonable valuation and uh, people are clamoring in and they fill it and then it's oversubscribed then you open up another note or safe uh, instrument at a slightly higher valuation and slightly more money and uh, you set it up so that can be oversubscribed and you keep going and then finally you get to your level where people say okay i, I don't want to miss it this time i want to get into the into the deal uh, there are arguments to be very reasonable on this um, uh, where, you know, because you want high quality investors, uh, you want protection from a down round. You know, if you get investment at a very high valuation, then uh, if you uh, have to do the next investment at a lower valuation, often investors don't like to do that, even if, they, even if it's a good deal because it's just too messy. Uh, second, uh, when you're looking at acquisition, if the acquirer says, OK, the investors came in at this valuation and they don't want to get into your deal, they don't want to buy your deal because it will annoy the investors, they think it will be messy as well. And in any case, if you're mispriced, you know, the next round investors will correct it anyway. And uh, it may result in a, uh, uh, a lower um, uh, percentage for the founders because they're going to have to deal with the mess. I will stop there and open shortly for uh, questions. And if there are any questions, I will uh, um, uh, I will uh, uh, answer them. And uh, okay, where does investing in form of convertible notes fall? It's from David Isogu. Right. Okay. So convertible notes are higher up in the stack. These are debt instruments. As an early stage company, typically um, these are uh, it doesn't really make much difference from the investor point of view. Um, often they're equivalent in safes, uh, equivalent to safes practically, uh, secured agreements for future equity, um, or, or even in the UK when you have common stock, um, a note by definition is debt, and it's much higher up in the stack. Um, but in practice, because you know usually our, 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 we don't have many assets anyway, it doesn't make much difference. It has a difference in tax advantages uh so typically people would prefer an equity deal because they can start clocks running in the us uh and in the uk they can get uh, seis uh tax credits all right any other questions okay how does a uk company qualify seis so uh it's more um on the company i think it's a, it's a uh, a different set of levels uh, for EIS and SEIS. SEIS is the seed. Uh, I forget exactly, but it's of the order. I think it's, I think it's the first five hundred thousand for SEIS and the first two million for uh, EIS. There's a whole set of regulations. All the all the stock has to have the same rights. Um, it's relatively easy. It has to be a small company. It has to have a 
no assets no bigger than a certain level uh usually if you're starting out you usually do qualify uh accordingly eis is for the uh stage up when the, when the, i think the seis you can only invest 150,000 pounds um uh, and it after that it then goes into eis which i think you can go up to uh two million but uh i'll stand corrected by anyone else okay what are the pros and cons of using your own fund well pros it sends a signal to your investors uh that you have got skin in the game uh typically those are limits uh also you will own more of the company if you've got your own uh financing uh if you can withstand it it makes you it's because it's your own money you will actually uh um look after it more you know you're going to be very very uh uh squeamish about overspending and it might be more sensible on how you spend it um the cons are is often personal funds are more limited um uh, so you've got to cut your own cloth but it does set a a good uh, signal to uh, other investors potentially other employees any other questions Right. Why wouldn't the founder want to raise as much money as possible as early as possible? Uh, as dilution, you will give up more of your company to uh, your um, uh, to to the investors, and as a result, um, you know you'll be beholden. At minimum, you'll give up a percentage. So you'll make uh, less. Uh, you'll own less of the company. At maximum, you'll also give up control. Your investors might fire you. Your investors might want you to go to a different direction. And because you're living your uh, company day to day, you will know as much, you know, you would be in the best position uh, to actually uh, figure out what uh, you can do. So I think this is the last uh, question. I will, um, uh, if you wish to send me an email, please uh, do so at ronjohn at r42group.com. And uh, I'd be happy to answer as best I can. Thank you very much.